Yes. Okay. Yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Start, please. Okay, so thank you to the organizer for inviting me. Um, so now in my talk, I will discuss some more field theoretical topic, which has to do with uh, general properties of quantum field theory and probably quantum field theory in presence of non-local uh, operators. So let me say right away, this is work based uh, on a collaboration with Zorko Margotsky, Mark Mezzay, and Aviariv Moshe, particularly the recent paper of uh, a bit more than a month ago, but also some uh, previous results. So as the title says, um, then my talk is going to be about line defects. So what is a line defect? So in, we are interested in general in studying physical systems that are described by quantum field theories, or more in general, most physical systems in the long distance limit are described accurately by quantum field theories. And then we are interested in studying probes of this system. So natural probes are probes which are extended in one dimension, so essentially lines, and these are what are line defects. So there are, of course, tons of examples in two-dimensional systems and defects can be boundaries or interfaces. Famously, the condo problem, which is the study of an interface in a two-dimensional CFT, led to development from Wilson to the, of the normalization group flow idea. In three dimensions, um, we have examples like impurities in lattice systems that I'll discuss today. And in four dimension, maybe what we typically care most about in high energy are Wilson and tube lines, which are essentially a mean to detect the phase of the gauge theory and have, of course, tons of applications in the logger. So let me start with a very formal introduction of what is a line defect from a QFT viewpoint. So there is two ways of thinking of a line defect. One is to think of it as some extended operator. So you have your actions in a semi-classical picture, you write some functional in terms of the fundamental field or specifying some boundary condition on a one-dimensional surface. Um, a more abstract, an even more abstract viewpoint, which is however very useful, is to think of the system given by the bulk theory plus the defect as a new system called defect quantum field theory. And uh, physically, this is because if your defects at standing time, then when you quantize lies in the defect, it's clear that the Hilbert space is modified by the presence of the defect. So that's why this viewpoint is often the most useful one. Um, in order to make progress, it's useful to focus on defects in theories which are scale invariant, so CFTs. Essentially, every quantum field theory non distance limit is a CFT, so it's a good, it's a good enough setup. And of course, a defect in a CFT may or not preserve uh, um, the conformal group along the line. So a defect may, in general, will preserve a subgroup of the d-dimensional conformal group, and the maximal one is the 1D conformal group times the rotation group around it. If the defect preserves this group, it's called a defect CFT. Um, so it's useful to give some, uh, to, to remind you some things about the defect CFT. So you know in CFTs, operators are classified according to their representation of the conformal group. So in the CFT, the same thing. So operators are classified according to representation of the one-dimensional conformal group. And additionally, besides the usual OP of between bulk operators that we have in CFTs, we have an OP between the bulk and the defect that allows to expand bulk operators in terms of defect operators close to the defect. So now the most general defect in a DCFT is not conformal invariant. Uh, in, a, in a CFT. And to see this, it's enough to start with a DCFT and add some perturbation along the line. So pretty much with two in normal CFTs, we trigger our G-flow by adding relevant perturbation integrated over the space-time. Here, we just integrate over the line. If the operator we add to, to the DCFT has k in dimension less than one, the perturbation is relevant, it will trigger an RG flow. Uh, a recent result that will play some um, tangential, but it's an important role in today's talk, is, um, so I don't know why, let me just put this, is that uh, uh, the RG flow is irreversible, and uh, in more particular, there is a C function, pretty much like the two-dimensional C function of the A, A quantity in 4D, that decreases monotonically under RG. And uh, this C function is nothing but the partition function for a defect placed on a circle, 
minus the partition function of the CFT without the defect. So this is kind of a generalized F function for one dimensional defect and it's called G. Um, this result was established in two dimension long ago following a conjecture of Papak and Ludwig by Peter and Konechny. And um, it was gen recently generalized to higher dimension which will be the main focus of today in a recent work with Zohar and Nadia. So today's talk, so with this general introduction in mind, today's talk, I want to discuss a very concrete example of line defects. And uh, the three examples that we want, I want to discuss are first, magnetic field defects. So this will be, again, you imagine having a condensed matter system, which has some lattice realization, and you turn on some uh, uh, magnetic field at some point in space. So this will provide, it's like a magnetic, so it's like a perturbation of crisis space, but not in time. A more, a, another famous example of defect, which uh, I will discuss at length is that of impurities. So you take some, again, some quantum critical model and you replace one of the atom with another, with a doping atom in a different representation of the spin SU2 group. And I'll finally discuss Wilson and Tooth lines briefly. And uh, I want to argue that even if you're not interested in condensed matter applications, the study of magnetic field defects in particular of impurities has many resemblance with the study of Wilson lines and conformal gauge theories. So it's a very useful playground to develop technology for the gauge theory problem. In particular, the main point of my talk will be that spin impurities and Wilson lines admit a semi classical description in the larger representation limit. So there is an appropriate limit in which, in the case of Wilson line, which the size of the representation becomes large, in which some sort of semi classics emerge and we can say a lot of things. So this is briefly the plan of the talks. So let me start with magnetic field defects. So again, as a, as a perspective, it's useful to comment on what are the three ways we will construct defect in a CFT today. The first one is to start with a bulk theory and do as I showed in the previous slide per tarp with a, bulk with a bulk operator whose k in dimension is less than one. We can think of this as perturbing the trivial line defect. So you start with a theory which has no defect and then you add an external field localized in, on a line. A slightly more involved construction invokes uh, an n-dimensional quantum mechanics that leaves on some line. And then you couple this quantum mechanics to the bulk CFT. This again will trigger some RG flow and generically leads to a defect CFT in the IR. This is what happens with impurity where the quantum mechanics are nothing but the degrees of freedom of the doping atom. Finally, Wilson lines is an extra generalization which is uh, of this construction where the n-dimensional quantum mechanics lives in a representation of a group G. Then you gauge the group G and couple it to the bulk. Also, you see the Wilson lines is some of the most involved examples among these three and that's somehow, somehow it I was I decided to start with external field defects. So let me discuss external field defects. So this external, the simplest defect you can construct is starting with a massless scalar in dimension less than four and add a perturbation localized to the scalar itself integrated along the line. I take dimension less than four because I want the perturbation to be relative. This defect is uh, of course, exact resolvable because we are in free theory. And it's easily shown that all non-trivial effects are encoded in one-point functions. Meaning one-point functions will display a certain power law behavior. It's coefficient h. This power law behavior coincides with the scaling dimension of the scalar field exact in equal form. It's like one over the distance. And that's because the coupling is marginal. In D less than four, however, the perturbation is relevant. And this power law behavior doesn't match what you expect in a scale invariant theory. So we interpret this by saying that the our G flow in, along the defect never terminates. And in fact, you can show that the G function I mentioned before flows to zero in the infrared. This is somewhat of a, a fact which is presumably related to the existence of a moduli space. So a more interesting example is the critical OM model in the presence 
of a magnetic field localizing space. Again, you can think of this as adding a perturbation. So the critical line model, as you know, is a CFT, which is strongly coupled close to D equal three, but it's approximately described by a non scalar field uh, in, uh, yes, by a non scalar field. Um, you can, Think of a, the effect of a magnetic field as adding a perturbation localized uh, on a line. And this perturbation is relevant because the scale dimension of the field is relevant and it breaks the Gouin group to n minus one. This setup is relevant in Monte Carlo when it's called pinning field. And in fact, there are measurements available and it's potentially realizable in experiments. So this is not a purely theoretical construction. Now, we wanted to study this problem I don't want to bore you on how you do that. As you know, studying the critical line model is a strongly coupled problem. And this perturbation I added is also strongly relevant. So you cannot do conformal perturbation theory. But OK, we can do epsilon expansion, which is pretty straightforward. It's way less straightforward, but I don't want to comment too much about it to do large gen, but we can also do that. And you can also get, you know, if you think of the model as a, in the space of D and N, you can also study it close to D equal to, and in fact, obtain a such solution in some cases in D equal to for this uh, ON model in the presence of the line defect. And therefore, and then we can try to extrapolate our results to get predictions in D equal three. So we did that. I just want to summarize some results because they will be useful in a moment. So the main, our main results concern the defect operator spectrum. So, and the two lowest dimensional operator on the defects are the tilt operator. So the tilt operator is an operator which is protected, which has dimension two, and transforms in a vector representation of the unbroken one minus one group. And we also obtained results for the lowest scaling dimension singlet, which is identified with phi one on the defect, which has scaling dimension, which has uh, scaling dimension on 1.5. Notice these values are very different from the scaling dimension in the bulk. And there is no reason why the defect operator spectrum should have anything to do with the bulk operator spectrum indeed. And uh, this, this result I wanna stress also for any value of n. And it's consistent in fact with Monte Carlo and with Largen. We also obtained order predictions including the G function and we happily found that it's uh, negative in the infrared fixed point, log of G is negative in agreement with the G theorem I mentioned before. So anyhow, Bottom line, somehow something can be said about this problem if it's strongly coupled. So why did I bring this up? And uh, you'll see in a moment. So let me now discuss impurities. That will be essentially the main topic of this talk. So again, the situation I want to describe is very similar. I take an O3 model in this case, in D dimensions, and I add a uh, perturbation which is localized in, uh, in space and it's proportional to some spin of the impurity. And now this perturbation will couple linearly to the bulk in the Hamiltonian in a lattice realization. And I'll consider both free and interacting potentials. How do you represent this in, uh, in a CFT language? It's pretty obvious and it's essentially actually what we do all the time with Wilson lines. You take a trace over a finite number of states, which are just, which are nothing but the states uh, of the impurity, the twist plus one states of the impurity. And uh, you couple a matrix, which uh, in the re reducible representation of SU2, to the vascular field phi in a usual way as to do with Wilson line with a path ordering up front. This, uh, there is an, a coupling gamma, which naturally represents the coupling between the impurity and the bulk. And this coupling will flow and essentially our task or that what people are interested in condensed matter is knowing what, what happens to the flow of this coupling gamma. So this is a remarkably hard problem, even in condensed matter, even in free theory. So different from the example I showed before in free theory that was exactly solvable, here there is a trace and there is a path ordering, therefore once you start doing perturbation theory in gamma, you will have tons of commutators and it soon get involved. People did uh, epsilon expansion and uh, found in that in the epsilon expansion where there is a fixed point for this coupling gamma. So it would be natural to conjecture 
that the infrared must be a non-trivial DCFT that describes the uh, lo long distance behavior of the impurity. However, I'll show in a moment that's not the case. Uh, well, you can also compute other stuff like the partition function for safety or defect. So, um, why did, so now I want to develop a new method to study this impurity, which will apply also to whistle lines. So to motivate these methods, let, I want to look at the largest limit of the impurity. So the limit in which the spin of the impurity is large. The representation here is very huge. And this is not trivial because if you think of doing perturbation theory, you see that each order grows with s. So say imagine you want to compute the partition function, the leading order will go like gamma square s cubed. Subleading order will go like gamma four s to the five, and next to next to leading order will gamma s six s to the seven. So it doesn't matter how small is your coupling gamma, if s is large, you need to do some resummation. So to understand what is the right resummation, it's useful to recast the result in, in a more convenient way. So if you start computing honestly, you find it's a weird exponentiation, which is that the partition function with some non-zero coupling is equal to the partition function zero coupling times an exponential of a series of a sum over loop order n, gamma to the two n, and a polynomial of order n plus one in s. So when s is sufficiently large, in particular when gamma square s is sufficiently large, clearly the series in the exponent in exponent cannot be truncated. Nonetheless, you can imagine grouping terms of the series together, all the leading terms of the gamma to n s n plus one together, and so forth so on, in a way that you recast the expansion as a series at large s and fits gamma square s. And this raises the question, can we make sense of this formula rather than by some grouping by hand loop terms instead as a resummation right away, or if you want as a, can we compute straight away f minus one and f naught in this formula? And the idea is yes, and the key idea is that you can expand the path integral around a suitable no classical trajectory. And this is similar to some work in our chart expansion that I've done before with Gilles Badet, Sasha Moni, Ricardo Rakatz. So how do you do that? And uh, the, the crucial piece of technology that I need is to introduce uh, an action for this defect CFT. And again, uh, this is, you can do the same in Wilson line. So I think that's fairly interesting. So you can represent this weird trace and path ordering as, in, as an action in terms of a B spinner living on a one dimensional line, constrained to have Z bar Z equal to, Z, to S. The constraint plus the U1 gauge invariance make the Hilbert space finite dimensional. Therefore, this action can be seen to describe the previous defect just with the identification that the spin operator is now a, bi a bilinear in terms of the quantum mechanical variables that. Once you have an action, it's pretty obvious. It's just enough to look for subtle point for this action to recast the expansion in a way which I showed before. More formally, you see that because if you rescale the field and Z by square root of S, the path integral itself admits a natural subtle point at gamma to zero and this gamma square S. And um, of course, and immediately you get the result in a way I showed before, just because the, the action is one over gamma square times an action which depends on gamma square S. In fact, something not trivial to see at this stage is that this also works in dimension close to three. And that's because essentially the largest limit becomes kind of a large n limit, which as you know, allows you to resum the leading strong effects in the RG. And this is special of the pre theory, of course, because in the bulk theory, you cannot overcome the bulk strong coupling with a large S in the defect, but here the bulk is weakly coupled, so large S is good enough. Just the only technical point I want you to appreciate of this subtle point is that the spin of the impurity on the subtle point is essentially frozen. So you can think of the spin as constant. And the integration, and this is true, actually almost true up to integration where zero mode because you will have just a family of subtle point and not just one subtle point. But still, this is important because having a constant spin now looks pretty much like 
what I showed before about the external field defect, because now the spin acts like an external field for the bulk field. And therefore, you should expect some equivalence between these two problems in the largest limit. And in fact, this can be shown explicitly. You can now compute, say, the beta function of the coupling. And here I plot it for you. I don't want to go through the details of this. But the main point is that uh, I just want to highlight two points is that first, with this largest approach, we find not one, but two fixed points for epsilon s sufficiently small. And one of these is non perturbative in the standard perturbation theory approach. So it cannot be seen without this technology. But most importantly, our approach allows to compute the beta function also the way when epsilon becomes large, even if s is as long as s is sufficiently large. And we see explicitly this beta function as a runaway. So keeps never reaches a zero. And this is precisely identical to what happened to an external field defect in free theory that I showed before. So in other words, in the equal free and s to infinity, the impurity is equivalent to an external field defect up to a zero mode and never reaches an a DCFT point. And uh, I forgot to add the citation here, but a paper a few days ago actually convalidated this prediction through numerical simulations, a uh, condensed matter paper by Voita and others. And uh, actually they validated for S equal one half. So even so we could do calculation for S to infinity only, we conjecture the result to hold all the way to spin one half. And indeed, indeed this was found um, I think two days ago. Okay, so now let me go to the maybe more interesting point, which is the interacting bar theory. Again, the theory is strongly coupled. Again, perturbation theory breaks down a sufficiently large S. And uh, okay, now you let me skip this. Now the point is that now you can do again. People could only study the blue region before, which is where you can do epsilon expansion. And when S, and this also you see the region gets smaller and smaller and S becomes large because perturbation theory behaves not very well. And what we did in our recent paper was developing a new approach that allows you to first do a sum perturbation theory in the epsilon expansion, so that you can do epsilon expansion for every S. And most importantly, we proposed, in fact, we sort of proved that in the largest limit, the description of the impurity is equivalent to an external field defect, pretty much as it happened in free theory. So even for the bar theory, we'll have this equivalence. And uh, this effective field theory description could be validated in the for small uh, for d close to four by epsilon expansion. So we have a number of results. Let me just argue them. And uh, before I showed you some results for the external field defect in the O3 ON model and O3 model, and those results translate immediately to this problem in light of this equivalence. Before we had an operator of protected dimension one. So here we have an operator of dimension one plus one over S correction. We had an operator of dimension 1.5. So here we have an operator of dimension 1.5 plus one over S correction. And we also could compute some one over S corrections for some observables, in particular the scaling dimension of the spin on the impurity, which is zero trading order because it's decoupled, but we could also, but just some one over S per corrections. And there are similar results for correlation functions and the G function. Okay, so this was maybe a bit fast, but the main point is that the large S approach allows you to um, reach regimes that people could not reach before. Um, okay, so finally, I want to discuss Wilson lines. So again, this is taking an n-dimensional quantum mechanics, coupling to the bulk, but now gauging the symmetry of the quantum mechanics. So I'll be discussing only a very specific example, which is how BPS loops in rank one superconformal field theories. So as you know, our BPS loops are generalization the wilson Maldacena loop, which is uh, a loop which contains both the scalar and the vector of the vector multiplet in n equal two theories. And uh, this was, uh, yeah. And generalization mean because I'm interested in an arbitrary representation. So not only the S equal, uh, not only the fundamental representation. There is also generalization of this problem to non-Lagrangian theories where half VPS loops are labeled by the electric and magnetic charge in the Coulomb branch. 
So what we asked is what can we say in the large representation limit? Now in principle, we could proceed as before, as we did in the impurity, we could de devise a double screening limit and study the theory of- Sorry, Bill, yes. you. Yeah, you have two minutes uh, to sum yeah, up. Yeah, yes, uh, I'm almost done. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we could in principle study in the double screen limit that we yeah, miss capping and large S, but instead we tried to do a more general strategy. At least we proposed that for protected observables, one could use a uh, universal effective filter in the large S regime. And the large S effective filter is just the Coulomb branch effective filter. So let me just jump to the results. So in this effective field theory, you could compute, what can you compute? We computed the partition function of a circular defect, which as you know, it's an interesting observable because of RG, as I said at the beginning, and we found that it grows exponentially with SAS, and it has some interesting correction, which depends on anomaly coefficients on the theory of the UV theory and the Coulomb branch. And we also could compute the one point function of the stress tensor in a one over SX function. So S is the size of the representation. And these results were explicitly validated in Lagrangian theories from localization and make instead non-trivial predictions for non-Lagrangian theories. And I should say again, this is very similar to former results by Heller, Mamed, Orlando, Leffert, and Watanabe in the large charge expansion in super conformative theories. Okay, so this was a lot. So let me just briefly summarize. So I discussed uh, some examples of line defects and um, in particular I discussed external field defect in the end model. I discussed a semi-classical treatment of large spin impurities and an effective filter interpretation for half BPS lines with large representations. There are many questions. One of them is, can we obtain more predictions for condensed matter applications? In particular, can we use bootstrap to analyze some of these impurities, for instance, in the UN model? And uh, maybe a more interesting question is what about non-supersymmetric Wilson lines? And uh, there, uh, as you know, some supersymmetric Wilson line source a large electric field. And when you have a large electric field, it's reasonable to expect instabilities related to the Schwinger effect. So the question, and this instability should be visible in the large representation limit. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question to understand what happens in that setup. And that's a work in progress in which we hope to, repair, to report uh, soon results. That's all, thank you. Thank you again, Gabriel, for your very nice and uh, interesting uh, presentation. If there is any question, uh, we are ready to hear. Please raise your hand. 